Our first presentation is called The Banner of the Third Angel, and you'll find it um, in your notebook on page three, assuming everyone has a notebook. Um, the first quote from Selected Messages, book two, page 114, says, Prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line. The more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, the more clearly we shall shall we understand the prophecy of Daniel for the revelation is the supplement of Daniel the more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God the deeper and surer even as the eternal throne will appear the truth of ancient prophecy we shall be assured that men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit's utterances through the prophets these messages were given not for those that uttered the prophecies, but for, the, for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment. The prophecies in the Bible were more directly given for God's people at the end of the world than they were for the people um, that were living when those prophecies were recorded. This is a, an important principle in prophetic study. It's easy to demonstrate um, this principle. Um, if you turn to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 10, verse 11 very probably a familiar verse to all of us first Corinthians 10 11 said now all these things happened unto them for in samples and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come all these things in biblical history are written for those of us that are living at the end of the world we operate in our prophetic studies upon the testimony of two or three establishes a thing according to Bible prophecy. Um, if you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, uh, verse 9 and 10, it says, The thing that hath been it is that which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun is there anything whereof it may be said see this is new it hath been already of old time which was before and then if you go forward to chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes verse 15 it says that which hath been is now and that which is to be hath already been and God requireth that which is past that which is to take place at the end of the world has already been identified and illustrated in biblical history and that last phrase of verse 15 says that God requireth that which is past meaning that he requires Seventh-day Adventists to understand that history and that's an agreement of course with Sister White that has the statement we're probably familiar with there is nothing um, to fear of the future except as we forget the Lord's teaching in our past history go to Romans chapter 15 verse 4 Ram Romans 15 verse 4 says whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope And 1 Corinthians 14 verse 32 says, And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of, conf the, of confusion. All the prophets are identifying the history, the prophetic history at the end of the world, and they all are telling the same history. They're subject to one another. John is not illustrating something something different about the Sunday law than Isaiah is illustrating if that were the case then God would be the author of confusion the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets and all the prophets are identifying the end of the world and if you go back to your quote where we started it says the last sentence says these messages were given not for those that uttered the prophecies but for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment the quote begins with a statement where Sister White says the more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel as Seventh-day Adventists we know that the 
three angels of Revelation 14 are flying in the midst of heaven and they each have a particular message to proclaim. Uh, the first angel announces fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. The second angel identifies the fall of Babylon and the third angel um, gives a warning about receiving the mark of the beast. Each of those messages can be taken and identified what they represent theologically. What does it mean to fear God and give him glory in the time of his judgment? What does it mean theologically to come out of Babylon? What does it mean theologically to receive the mark of the beast? And this is a correct way to approach these messages. But there are other ways to approach these messages because these messages were prophecies that arrived in history. Um, we identify William Miller with the m as the messenger of the first angel's message. It arrived in the history. The first angel arrived in the history of William Miller. The second angel's message arrived in June of 1842. The third angel's message arrived on October 22nd, 1844. So even though these three messages have a theological component, they also have a historical application that we are to understand. And when Sister White is here saying, the more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, I submit to you that she is emphasizing the historical fulfillment of these messages. Uh, there is a banner. In fact, I would say that this is the banner of the three angels' messages. This is identifying the historical sequence of the three angels' message. And she's saying, the more firmly we stand under this historical sequence of events, the more clear will become the ancient truths of prophecy. The banner of the three angels' message is a prophetic tool that allows us to clarify the prophecies of the Bible. This is not, I'm not denying the theological understanding of the three angels' message. I'm saying, and, and I don't have, this is a general breakdown of every reform movement, but this is also the breakdown of the Millerite history. This is 1798, this is 1833, this is 1840, this is 1842, this is 1844, and this, in the terms of what we're dealing with is the banner of the three angels messages that allows us to bring into clarity the ancient truths of prophecy in agreement with this quote. This next quote says, by the way this is kind of, it may be brand new to you, I'm sorry, but it's kind of review and trying to put some things in place so I'm going to move through it kind of quickly to put it into the record of what's being recorded and put it into the hopefully the record of your mind so we can refer back to it Sabbath and Sunday. Councils and writers to the editors page 26 says the proclamation of the first second and third angels message have been located by the word of inspiration not a peg or a pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. She here isn't speaking about the theological meaning of the first, second, and third angel's message. She is speaking about where they arrived in history. The second angel's message, according to Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21, Sister White says, in June of 1842, the Protestant churches closed their doors against William Miller's message. That's where the second angel's message has been located. Okay, so she's emphasizing where the messages came into history, and she's emphasizing that it's important to be clear about where they came into history, and that it is wrong to change where they came into history. All right, you can't do it. It's a warning flag. Don't move these things around. Um, and she says this often. Next quote, Selected Messages, Book 2, page 104. The first and second angel's message were given in 1843 and 1844, and we are now under the proclamation of the third, but all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for the truth. By pen and voice we are to sound the proclamation. And what are we supposed to do when we sound the proclamation? Showing their order. Right? Showing the, how the sequence in, in which they came into history. Showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without a first and second. These messages we are to give, in, give to the world in publication in do discourses. And then here's the important part probably, or at least one of the important parts of this quote. 
these messages we are to give to the world in publications and discourses showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. Because where the messages of the three angels arrived in history during the Millerite time period, their location, how they came into history, allows you to identify the things that will be in the history of the 144,000. Because that history is repeated. Publishing ministry, ministry, page 175, says, Again and again I've been shown that the past experiences of God's people are not to be counted as dead facts. We are not to treat the record of these experiences as we would treat a last year's almanac. The rep record is to be kept in mind for history will repeat itself. All right? And what history is she th talking about will repeat itself? Prophetic history. You know, some people don't want to hear that prophecies will be repeated and some people don't want to hear that history will be repeated. But it is clear in inspiration that prophetic history will be repeated. This, this particular quote, the next one, The Great Controversy 343, is, is a, one of the most important ones to our study. And I would hope to our... Um, our continuing study long after this weekend. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present, and what's the important movement of the present? First, let me ask this. Are we at the end of the world? This, this is the end of the world, right? We have all the evidences, the economic collapse, the wars, the rise of the papacy, uh, on and on. All the prophetic evidence is in place. We have no reason to continue sleeping on. We're at the end of the world. And the important reform movement at the end of the world is identified in the Bible as the reform movement of the 144,000, right? When the 144,000 are raised up to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and finish the work and go home, correct? So when she's saying the important movements of the present, she's talking about the important reform movement of the 144,000. Am I twisting that passage? I don't think so. The important movement movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past and the experience of the church in the former ages has great lessons of great value for our own time. Sister White is telling us that the reform movement of the 144,000 has been paralleled by all the other reform movements of sacred history. Next quote, Education 191. <coughs> the Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. I'll show you. Hey, I'll show you something here. We'll, I'm going to play be a, play a little bit fast and loose here. Turn with me, if you would, to Ezekiel th 37. Now, I don't want to be. Um, I'm, I'm not looking at anything up up there. I'm thinking. All right. Uh, I'm looking, I'm trying to reach for a word. I don't want to be divisive or argumentative, or I don't want to be. Uh, uh, critical, uh, but what I'm going to share with you is an illustration of where the modern theologians in Adventism have a problem with me. And they have lots of problems with me, but one of them is, is that I exercise what they call is bad exegesis. All right, and uh, I've understood exegesis to mean biblical study, but it doesn't really mean that. I've come to learn what exegesis means. It's, it's a much more negative word than we've been led to believe in Adventism. But in any case, part of their criticism of my bad ed exegesis is that I will take a big biblical term from one place in the Bible, and I'll connect it with a biblical term, the same biblical term somewhere else in the Bible. And I think that's what Sister White said. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. All right? So if you're in Ezekiel 37, are you in Ezekiel 37? Look at verse 9. We will deal with this more in detail, uh, Lord willing, this weekend. But in verse 9 of Ezekiel 37, there, this is where the prophecy of Ezekiel brings the dead bones to life. All right? This is the, the verse where it happens. And it says, 
Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe upon these slain, that they might live. For me, now here's where my bad exegesis comes in, I say that the prophecy that brings God's people to life at the end of the world is the prophecy of the four winds, and the four winds are found in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, they're the winds that are restrained. And Sister White says the four winds are represented by the angry horse of Islam. So maybe it's bad exegesis to see the four winds right there in verse 9 of Ezekiel 37. But brothers and sisters, that's what Sister White says. Scripture is to be par compared with Scripture. Back to the quote, the student should learn to view the whole world as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy and the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and he should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. I like this next quote as a, an, a, a good illustration of what prophecy is. Sometimes we don't think, we don't t tell ourselves what is prophecy. We don't ask ourselves and then conceptualize what prophecy is. Uh, this is a passage where Sister White is speaking about how the Millerites shared their message and their history. And she says, historical events showing the direct fulfillment of prophecy were set before the people, people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. <coughs> the word delineate in, sis in the Webster's Dictionary of Sister White's Day and Age means to set forth upon a line. And this is an example of this. This is a line. And she says the line leads down to the end of this world's history. And if we were to apply Miller's history to this reform movement, we'd say the time of the end for the Millerites was 1798. And that judgment began in 1844. So the, the, the unfolding of this history is leading down to the end of the world. That's the direction it goes. And prophecy is demonstrated as being fulfilled by historical events. In eight, August 11th, 1840, you have the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. That was a historical event. In June of 1842, you have the Protestant churches of the United States closing their doors against the Millerites. That was a historical event. These historical events are identifying the fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy is not some philosophical concept that is recognized and that's the fulfillment of prophecy. The fulfillment of prophecy is a historical event that can be illustrated on a timeline that leads down to the end of the world and she says that these prophecies are figurative. And in, to give you an illustration of what that means, in 1798, which was the time of the end for the Millerites, there was a prophecy fulfilled. And what was the prophecy that was fulfilled in 1798? The, the papacy received its deadly wound. That was a historical event, was it not? It was a fulfillment of prophecy. Was it, was it not? But it was figurative. Why was it figurative? Because it's an illustration of the final demise of the papacy way down here at the end of the world. The papacy's deadly wound is, is, a, is prefiguring the final demise of, of the papacy at the end of time. Historical events that are identified as the fulfillment of prophecy, and those events are figurative. AD 70 was the fulfillment of prophecy. What prophecy is AD 70 a fulfillment of? Is it not Daniel 9.26, the people of the prince that shall come shall, dis shall destroy the sanctuary in the city? A prophecy that Jerusalem would be destroyed, it was fulfilled in AD 70. That was a historical event. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. And Sister White plainly tells us that the destruction of Jerusalem is an illustration of the very end of the world during the seven last plague times period. It's figurative. The history, history is figurative. Welcome to those of you that just arrived. We're on page four of your notes if you received them. 
Okay, we want to deal with a little bit with lines, under prophetic lines from Review and Herald, July 31st, 1888. It says, we must have a knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy. Prophecies are lines. If we're going to be able to illustrate prophecy on a line, as Sister White said in the previous course, quote, then obviously, in some sense, prophecy is a line. We must have knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy and understand the specifications given by the prophets and by Christ and the apostles that we may not be ignorant but be able to see the day is approaching so that with increased zeal and effort we may exhort one another to faithfulness, piety, and holiness. And brothers and sisters, there are other quotes that, that convey a thought that's in this quote that's worth understanding. There's a prophetic message that is coming to God's people right now that is testing them. And if they do not, if God's people do not receive the prophetic message that the Lord is opening up to them, they will be lost. That can be demonstrated by these reform histories. There's an increase of knowledge, and that increase of knowledge tests that generation. And one of the stumbling blocks in Adventism that exists today that prevents men and women from understanding the prophetic message is the idea that, well, we really don't know what prophecy is until after it's fulfilled. And Sister White plainly says that that understanding is wrong. But here she's saying that too. She says we, may, we can't be ignorant. We have to see that these things are approaching before they arrive in order to encourage each other to be pious and get ready. So when we're studying prophecy, it's a false concept to think that we can only understand prophecy correctly after it's fulfilled. It's not simply a false concept. It's absolutely deadly to believe that. You're re we're required. There's a statement where she says, we, it'll be just as deadly for us not to understand that it's approaching as it was for the antediluvians, not to understand that the flood was coming. That's a prayer phrase, but she says that. She says we are required to know when it's dear. The point of reference for prophecy is the book of, of Revelation in the next quote from Acts the Apostle page 585 she says in the Revelation all the books of the Bible meet an end if all the prophets are illustrating the end of the world um, and they are and they're all in agreement with each other and they are the point of reference where all the prophetic testimony comes together is the book of Revelation this is where the blueprint for um, un understanding end time Bible prophecy will be identified. <coughs> but Daniel and Revelation are the same prophecy. The next quote, Manuscript Release, Volume 9, page 7 and 8. Revelation is a sealed book, but it's also an open book. It records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. Brothers and sisters, this is a stumbling block for many in Adventism. They will tell you that yes, Sister White emphasizes that we need to understand the book of Revelation, but it's clear that what we need to understand is righteousness by faith because the latter rain message was brought to us by Jones and Wagner in 1888 and what they brought was the message of righteousness by faith therefore when Sister White's saying that we need to understand the book of Revelation in order to understand righteousness by faith that dwelling upon the prophetic events is not accurate to what we should be doing but notice what Sister White says she says it records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. The teachings of this book are definite, not mystical and unintelligible. I've been in an email dialogue with a brother from this area over the past few days here since I've been here. And one of the things that, that he does not appreciate about my understanding of prophecy is I'm just a little bit too strong on what I understand. You know, you, if, if, you, if you find these things, at least leave room for the possibility that you're incorrect. The teachings of this book are definite, not mystical and unintelligible. In it, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. 
these reform lines. You can demonstrate the, these reform lines here in the history of Noah, Elijah, Moses, the three decrees, the time of Christ, the Millerites, the 144,000. And it seems like I'm missing one other, but that's the three decrees. Um, they've been repeated over and over again, and therefore it means that as students of prophecy, uh, we should be adding greater importance to the understanding these lines of prophecy. Um, now we're, you'll, you can turn in your Bible or you can read it right off your page. Um, Isaiah 28 verses 9 through 13. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And remember Isaiah is a prophet that is doing what? He's identifying the end of the world. Alright, this, this is more about the end of the world than it was about when Isaiah wrote it. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept unto precept, upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. <coughs> There's several, th we're going to go through this a little bit carefully here at the beginning. The first thing I would point you to is um, the people that are under discussion here. It says this is the people to whom this particular message is the rest and the refreshing. You can, you can see that right there. It says, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the re refreshing. And it says, yet they would not hear. Whatever the re rest and the refreshing is, it has to be a message. Because there's a, there's a group of people that they're re the way they respond to whatever this rest and refreshing is, is they refuse to hear it. Okay, so what do we refuse to hear? We refuse to hear something that can be heard. It, whatever the rest and refreshing uh, ends up being, it is a message. And in your, the next quote, Sister White defines for us what refreshing is. Great Controversy 611. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfillment in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Whatever, if you go back to Isaiah 28 here, whatever the, the rest and refreshing is, according to Sister White, the refreshing is the latter rain, but it's a message. So there's a latter rain message that comes to God's people. Let me ask you a question. Now, I, I know this is the first meeting. This is also the end of a, a hectic week and the end of a long drive up on this mountaintop, but everyone seems to be a little bit preoccupied. Um, so... L let me a let me ask you a question. At what point in time would this refreshing message come? During the latter rain, right? At the end of the world. There is going to be, brothers and sisters, a latter rain message that comes to God's people during the time of the latter rain. And some of us will not accept that message. W they refuse to hear. That's what Isaiah says. Now, d follow this carefully. If I'm teaching error here, then this is one of the main building blocks of my erroneous position. So think this one through. The refreshing, according to Sister White, is the latter rain, but it's a message because it can be heard. And it's identified in the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy that some of us won't receive it. And it's identified also in Advent history. Has there ever been a latter rain message delivered to Seventh-day Adventist church? Amen. When? 1888. 
were not Jones and Wagner the messengers of the 1888 message and was not that the message of the latter rain? Did the majority of the people in Adventism receive that message? No, that history is recorded for our benefit. That's sacred history. That's sacred history. You know, if, if the sacred history of ancient Israel is an illustration of the end of the world that modern Israel is to learn from, then the history of modern Israel is also sacred history that modern Israel is to learn from. And 1888 is a, t is a testimony to the fact that when the latter rain time period arrives, there's a message that comes to God's people and it tests them. Councils of Diet's Foods, page 33. The refreshing or power of God comes only on those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them, bids them, namely cleansing themselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Up here, this is our ministry's website. This is um, Edgar's web website. And, but in our, at our website... Um, if you're someone that surfs the web, if you go to our website, there is a n we have our newsletters over the past many years on there. And if you get the newsletter from November 2007, this is 2008, right? It's 2009. November, this is 2008. 2009. Okay, all right. <laughs> I see how much traveling I do. So you go and you, you download the newsletter from 2008. And you will see a very thorough presentation on the latter rain. And the latter rain is something that is largely misunderstood by God's people. And I, we don't have time to go through all those details here. So I'm referring, that's why this is up here. I knew at this point I wanted to refer that to you. Because some people are convinced that the latter rain is poured out exclusively at the Sunday law. And this isn't true. It isn't true. It's not the testimony of inspiration. The latter rain begins to sprinkle on God's people before the Sunday law. Some people think that the testimony of inspiration is, is only those that have already perfected Christian character receive the latter rain. This is not true either. Sister White says the latter rain revives us. Hmm. But she says that revival is an awakening from spiritual death. I can be spiritually deaf and receive the latter rain and be awakened. Of course, she further teaches that at that point, I have to respond in agreement with the latter rain message if I'm going to be saved by its effect. But she does not teach that you only receive the latter rain if you perfected your character fully. And those kind of concepts are essential if you're going to understand the details of what takes place in the time period of the latter rain. And most of those arguments are presented fairly well in the November 2008 newsletter. Um, in the passage, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? We're still in Isaiah 28, but I, I repeat this, these verses as we go down through our notes to make different notes, to make different points. It raises the question there in verse 9, Of whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk. The, the people that are going to understand the knowledge and the doctrine that arrives in the latter rain time period are people that are weaned from the milk. And if you're not sure about what the milk of God's word is, you have underneath there the passage from Hebrews 5, verse 12, on into chapter 6 verse 2 and we'll read that it says for for when the time you ought to be teachers and we, we're going to show you in a moment that we're now in the time period when we ought to be teachers none of the 144,000 are going to be those that are not teacher all all of the 144,000 will be teachers we're going to show you that so what Paul is saying is Paul a prophet then he's speaking about the end of the world and at the end of the world he's talking about the time when all of God's people are to be teachers during the latter rain. Pardon me? Yeah, it's in Hebrews 5 verse 12 you have it in your notes on page 5 in the sender under milk and meat but perhaps you want to read it in the Spanish but it's 
it's it's there. It says, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracle of God, and are become such of have need of milk and not of strong drink. Milk is the first principles of the oracle of God and oracles of God. And then Paul gives us a breakdown of what the milk of God's word is. He says, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belong to them that are full of age are of full age even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern discern both good and evil therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ let us go on into perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God of the doctrine of baptism, baptisms and of the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Brothers and sisters, these doctrines are absolutely true, but they're the milk of God's word. There isn't any of us in this room, if we've been baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church, that shouldn't understand these doctrines before we entered into the baptismal pool. These are the fundamentals of Adventism and these are the milk. And in Isaiah 28 verse 9 it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge in the latter rain time period? Whom shall understand the doctrines of the latter rain? Those that will understand it are those that are weaned from the milk. <laughs> they're, you're, they're no longer trying to decide what justification by faith is. They know what justification by faith is. They're no longer swimming around in their mind wondering what righteousness by faith is. They know the teachings of Desmond Ford are erroneous. All right? They understand these things. They're weaned from the milk of God's word. That doesn't mean they don't... Anyway. Sister White's in agreement with that in early writings, page 63. She says, There are many precious truths in contained, in God, in, contained in the word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. There's, there's priorities of truth. And in every generation, there is a special truth for that generation. And that's present truth for that generation. And there's a present truth message for the generation of the latter rain. And the generation of the latter rain is the 144,000. And then, uh, going back to verse 9, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And in answering that, we read from Hebrews 5.12, for the, when the time you ought to be teachers. And at the bottom of page 5, you have some verses out of Daniel 12. And we're going to look at those in order to identify knowledge and teachers. In Daniel 12, verse 3, it says, And they that be wise, and if you have a marginal reference in your Bible for the wise in Daniel 12.3, what does your marginal reference say? Teachers. The wise of Daniel 12 are teachers. And they that be the teachers shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they shall turn many to righteousness, righteousness as stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. What will the wise understand? Pardon me? Well, yeah, you're jumping too far out of Daniel. What will they understand in the t context of the verses that we just read? Verses 3, 4, and 10. They're going to understand the, the increase of knowledge. In that history, there is an increase of knowledge. I say that history because that was fulfilled in each of these reform movements. In each of these reform movements, there is an increase of knowledge that begins at the time of the end that test that generation and the wise of that un generation they understand the increase of knowledge that takes place for that generation and the wise of that generation are the teachers so when Isaiah 28 verse 9 says whom shall he teach knowledge well he'll teach it to the wise they'll receive it um, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine the wise how important is this knowledge? Next page, page 6, you have at the top of the page, Hosea 4, 6, which says, And is Hosea a prophet? Therefore Hosea is speaking about the end of the world. 
He says, my people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. And in Daniel 12, the wicked don't understand the increase of knowledge, but the wise understand the increase of knowledge. And the wise are those that are going to understand, and because they're wise, they're going to teach the increase of knowledge. Follow the logic? Say amen if you follow the logic. Okay. Um, notice 1 Peter 1, verses 19 through 21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be what? False teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift, swift destruction. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world even Peter and the end of the world is a time period when the wise are going to understand the increase of knowledge and the wise are going to be those that are teaching the increase of knowledge and during that history I guarantee that they're going to be opposed by false teachers. If you're going to understand the latter rain history, then you have to acknowledge that there's a controversy that goes on in all these reform movements it is identified. We've already read a reference to it in Daniel 12.10. The wise understand, but the wicked do not understand. The wicked are the false teachers. At least part of them are the false teachers. Now, what I'm doing is I'm applying Isaiah 28 and 29 to the end of the world. And I'm not going into detail now like I do sometimes about all the components of Isaiah 28 and 29 being at the end of the world. But I have this quote in here for those people that, that struggle with what I say about Isaiah 28 and 29 being at the end of the world. Not in your notes. You'll notice I'm going very quickly here. Um, I can see I'm running out of time that's why I'm going so fast. If you go to, uh, in your Bibles to Isaiah 28, in verse 1 it says, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay, there's a woe pronounced upon the drunkards of Ephraim. And if you want to know who the drunkards of Ephraim are, just go into verse 14. It says, Wherefore hear ye the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. The drunkards of Ephraim, according to Isaiah, are the scornful men that rule Jerusalem. And according to Sister White in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 211, Jerusalem at the end of the world is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And there is a pronouncement that is levied against our people. And the pronouncement is, is that we become drunk. And I Isaiah 28 and 29, they're, they don't end. They're not two different visions. It's a continuation. If you go to Isaiah 29, it dis tells us what this drunkenness is. In verse 9 it says, Stay yourself and wonder. Cry out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers he hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the word, words of a book that is sealed. What book is sealed in Bible prophecy? The drunkenness that comes upon God's people at the end of the world is illustrating their inability to understand the prophetic message of Daniel and Revelation. 29 verses 9 through 11. I got halfway through verse 11. Verse 11 says, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men delivered to one that is learned, saying, And who's the learned in Adventism? Let's say leadership, all right? This is where I get in trouble. Some people think I'm attacking the leadership here, and I'm not. I'm just... I'm referring to what Isaiah is telling us about the end of the world. A and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of, the of a book that is sealed. And I'm su submitting to you that that's Daniel and Revelation, the prophetic book. Which men to de deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. But if you think this is just levied at the leadership, then read on. 
and the book is delivered to him that is not learned who, if the leadership is the learned who is it that's not learned it's the lay people that it's you and me right it says and the book is to deliver to him that is not learned and saying read this I pray thee and he saith I'm not learned now the, the, the excuse of the learned people in Adventism for not understanding the book of Daniel is that it's sealed can't understand it this prophecy sealed the excuse of the lay people isn't that the book is sealed their excuse is is that they'll only accept the message of Daniel and Revelation if it's taught to them by somebody that is learned but the learned can't teach it to them because it's sealed to them so it's one of these catch-22 type things but in the midst of that is where we started in Isaiah 28 verse 9. In the midst of this pronouncement about Seventh-day Adventist church having the inability to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation in the latter rain time period. Verse 9 says, Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. What's God's ordained method to speak to his people? Prophets, what's another one? The preachers, the teachers, the leadership. But it says here, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To what people? Next verse. The people to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. What people in prophetic history are the people to he said, who he has said, you are the people that are going to receive the latter rain? There's only one people that have been promised to receive the latter rain, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is about the Seventh-day Adventist church. And then in verse 13 it says, But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And brothers and sisters, what we're suggesting here is that the message, the laddering message that comes to God's people at the end of the world that there will be a shaking over is illustrated by bringing line upon line from this part of the Bible, that part of the Bible. The prophetic line of Moses laid over the top of the prophetic line of Noah, laid over the top of the prophetic line of Elijah, laid over the prophetic line of Cyrus laid over the prophetic line of Christ laid over the prophetic line of the Millerites will illustrate the prophetic line of the latter rain history. Now when I make this application about Isaiah 28 and 29 and, and people begin to get nervous about how critical I'm being about leadership the reason that I have this very long quote in here is to let you know that, that I at least stand in good company when I do so. In, on page 6 where it says I, Isaiah 29 every word will be fulfilled you'll see Sister White quoting the very passage of Isaiah that we were just dealing with and in the third paragraph when she begins to give commentary on this verses she says every word of this will be fulfilled so she's placing this in the here and now right now there are those who do not humble their hearts before God and who will not walk uprightly. They hide their true purposes and keep in fellowship with the fallen angel who loveth and maketh a lie. The enemy puts spirit upon the men whom he can use to deceive those who are partially in the dark. Some are becoming imbued with the darkness that prevails or, and are setting truth aside for error. The day pointed out by prophecy has come. Jesus Christ is not understood. Jesus Christ is to them a fable. At this stage of earth's history, many men act, many act like drunken men. And then she quotes the passage where the drunkenness is identified. And the next paragraph, she says, the developments of the last days will soon become decided. When these spiritualistic deceptions are revealed to what revealed to be what they really are the secret workings of evil spirits those who have acted apart in them will become as men who have lost their minds she quotes more from Isaiah 28 and in the final paragraph she says it is presented to me that in our experience we have been and are meeting this very condition of things men who have had great light and wonderful privileges have taken the word of what of leaders who think themselves wise and have who have been greatly favored and blessed by the Lord but who have not 
who, but who have taken themselves out of the hands of God and placed themselves in the ranks of the enemy. The world is to be flooded with specious fallacies. One human mind ex accepting these fallacies will work upon other human minds who have been turning the precious evidence of God's truth into a lie. These men will be deceived by fallen angels when they should have stood as what? They're the faithful guardians watching for souls as they that must give an account. They have laid down the weapons of their warfare and have given heed to seducing spirits that make no effect the counsel of God and set aside his warnings and reproofs and are positively on Satan's side giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. On your next page <laughs> when, we, when we talk about the every reform line being the same, these reform movements, uh, remember we read a quote that the Lord doesn't repeat things that are of no great consequence. This is an illustration of a reform movement. But for, for purposes of making a point here, we're going to say this is the reform movement now of the Millerite time period. And I haven't put the dates on here because I want to just refer to this in a general sense to the different histories. This is the first angel's message. This is the second angel's message. This is the, the third angel's message. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that we're now waiting for what? The, f the fourth angel's message. There's a break in time between the third angel's message and the fourth angel's message. The third angel's message arrives in 1844. The fourth angel's message comes at the end of the world, right? Okay. In that sense, these messages are a 3-1 combination. The three, the three messages arrived in the Millerite history, but the fourth message of Revelation 18 comes down here in this history, okay? Once you see that, that the, this history is built upon a 3-1 combination, then you will find the 3-1 combination in two different types of illustration in God's Word. You will find it in a simple form and you'll find it in a complex form. And uh, on page 8 of your notes you'll see some, not all, you'll see some of the simple illustrations. Noah and his three sons. Now We're saying that the 3-1 combination represents the three angels messages that came into history in the Millerite time period and is followed by the fourth angel of Revelation 18 in the latter rain time period. We're saying that the 3-1 th combination is illustrating the end of the world. It's, it's appropriate to identify all of Advent history, including the Millerites, as the end of the world. When you understand that the beginning of Adventism uh, and the end of Adventism can't be separated. And in that sense, when you have Noah and his three sons, was the story of Noah an illustration of the end of the world? Absolutely. What about Balaam's three blessings? followed by the fourth blessing after King Balak was disappointed by the three blessings and sent him home. Yes, that's Numbers 22. That's the story of the children of Israel just before they went into the Promised Land. This is a clear illustration of the end of the world. What about the three disciples with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? Plainly told, that's an illustration of the end of the world. What about the three disciples with Christ in Gethsemane? Plainly told, that's an illustration of the end of the world. These simple illustrations are saying that each of these histories where we find this combination has a direct message that we are allowed to understand and apply at the end of the world. Um, what about, why wasn't Daniel, why wasn't Daniel around in Daniel chapter 3? Because he would have broke the combination. Because it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were thrown into the fly fiery furnace. And then the fourth appeared. And Sister White says at least 11 different times that the testing image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3 is an illustration of the Sunday law. And if Daniel had been there, it would have been a 4-1 combination, not a 3-1 combination. And the story there in Daniel 3 has a specific piece of information that is to be brought down to the end of the world and understood. A a as an example, so you know what I mean, um, I don't have it in here in the simple illustrations. I have Gideon and his three troops, Abraham and the three heavenly visitors, but I'll give you one that's not there. 
Sister White says that in the very near future, every earthly support is going to be cut off from the faithful Seventh-day Adventist. Does she not? Where do we find perhaps the best illustration of that time period? Story of Job. Job had three friends. And so when you take the story of Job and the three-one combination therein, and you bring it down to the end of the world, Job is telling us about the time period when every earthly support is cut off at the end of the world. But... When you take Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the furnace and then Christ appears with them, it's not talking about the time period when either, every earthly support is cut off. What it's telling us is that the whole world was represented there in that testing time. All the kings, governors, rulers, and satraps from all of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was there to watch Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get thrown in the fly, fiery furnace and as they watch the crisis of the furnace and they see Christ with them, they went back to their homes and they spread the message. Daniel 3 is telling us with the 3-1 combination how the message gets carried to the world. It gets carried to the world in the time period of a great crisis when God's people perfectly reflect the character of Christ. Each of these simple illustrations of the 3-1 combination have their own little piece of the pie to contribute to the illustration of the latter rain time period. But the more important latter rain illustrations are the complex illustrations. And, th and th this is one of them. Th this, is, this is the characteristics at the bottom in the middle of page 8. You'll see the characteristics of the way marks. All right? What I mean by that is that each of these reform movements begin with the time of the end. All right? The most information that we have I under, that I believe about the time of the end is from Daniel chapter 12. And Daniel chapter 12 tells us that at the time of the end there will be an increase of knowledge. All right? And that increase of knowledge is recognized by the wise who are, according to Daniel 12, running to and fro in God's word. At the time of the end, there will be an, a prophecy that is unsealed for this generation. Because every one of these reform movements has their own specific time of the end. All right, Every one of them. And when that time of the ar end arrives for that generation, there's an increase of knowledge and there is a certain group of that generation that begins to understand from the prophetic word what that increase of knowledge represents. Um... The time of the end is marked by a fulfillment of a prophecy. The time of the end in the Millerite history was the fulfillment of the papacy receiving the deadly wound. This prophecy that fulfills the time of the end in each of these histories will contribute light to this history. And Daniel 7 tells us that it was not until the papacy received the deadly wound that we should expect judgment to arrive. So when this prophecy was fulfilled and the papacy had received its deadly wound, this generation was the generation that was going to announce that judgment was to arrive. The fulfillment of this prophecy contributes light to that generation. Is this, has everyone already studied these things? How many have already went through the, this particular presentation? How many haven't? How many refused to raise your hand? Okay, so I, ha I, I, won't go, I won't go as fast as I could. When the increase of knowledge arrives, at some point in time, the message for this generation is formalized. All right? In the Millerite history, the time of the end, Great Controversy 356, was 1798. The papacy received the deadly wound. The book of Daniel was unsealed. Students of prophecy began to understand the prophecies of Daniel. And by 1833, uh, it, could, it was before that, but by 1833, I mark that because that's when William Miller received his credentials, Miller had put the message that had been opened up into an understanding that men could be held accountable for. Because this is a test. This message that's opened up to this generation is a test. Does anyone in this room doubt that? Because Advent history tells us plainly that on October 21st, on October 21st, 1844, how many Millerites were there? 50,000. How many were there on October 23rd? 50. I'm talking about faithful. 
That message had tested this generation. And what happened to the 49,950 that flunked the test? According to Sister White, they were praying to Satan and Satan was answering their prayers. Wasn't a minor test, life or death test. So if this generation is going to be tested by this message, the Lord isn't arbitrary. He's going to put that message into a package where he can hold you and I accountable for it. Where he's going to say, no, look, this message was crystal clear. You had, had opportunity to evaluate and judge this message and respond to it accordingly, and you didn't. I'm holding you accountable. So in these reform movements, you'll find there comes a point in time when the, the message is formalized. There, maybe there's a better way to express, it, express that. I'm, that's my words. William Miller, 1833, first angel's message is formalized. The message goes through history and then it's empowered on August 11th, 1840 with the fulfillment of the 391 year 15 day time prophecy of Revelation 9 verses 14 and 15. And it's empowered because at that point in 1838, two years before that event, the Millerites were already telling the world that in 1840 the Ottoman Empire is going to c collapse in fulfillment of Revelation 9 verses 14 and 15. And we know this because we use the year day principle of Bible prophecy, which is the same principle that we're using to identify the end of the world in 1843. Nobody believed them, but when it came to pass right on time in 18, August 11th, 1840, then the whole world knew what they were saying about the year day principle was valid and the message was empowered. And when the message of these histories in, is empowered, you see a divine symbol descend. The divine symbol that descended in the Millerite history was the angel of Revelation 10. <coughs> in, the, in the history of Moses, it's when the Lord came down and brought the test of circumcision to Moses. In the history of the three decrees, it's when Michael came down in Daniel 10 and turned Cyrus around to pass the first decree. In the history of Christ, it's when the dove came down at the baptism of Christ. When these messages are empowered, there's a divine symbol that descends and all these histories that are illustrating this point are pointing forward to the history of the 144,000. And when is it that the, his the message of the 144,000 is empowered? when the angel of Revelation 18 descends. They're all pointing forward to that time period when the angel of Revelation 18 descends and joins the third angel's message and the earth is lightened with his glory. The, in this history here, the history of for the Millerites of the first message, this is where the foundation is laid. It's easy to show that William Miller was the man that the Lord used to raise the foundational truths of Adventism that are reflected on that 1843 chart. Okay, they, they are, they were, the Millerites all participated in that, but let's, we all know that the one that is held accountable for it is William Miller. After all, what do they call those people? The Millerites, okay? He's the, he's the one that was used to raise up the foundations. And, it, and in the history of the three decrees, which is the history of a reform movement, the foundation of the temple was laid in the history of the first decree. And in the history of Christ, the foundational message of that time period was laid by John the Baptist, who Sister White points to as a type of William Miller. The foundation is always laid in this history and the second way Mark, the second angel's message will always demonstrate some activity of the enemies of that time period. June of 1842 the Protestant churches closed their doors against the Millerite message. Paralleling when the Sanhedrin in the history of Christ decided that it was important for Christ to die rather than the whole nation perish. Paralleling when Pharaoh decided that the Jews, if they're going to take Sabbath off, they're going to gather their own straw and they're going to make the same amount of bricks as they go forward. Paralleling a decree that stopped the construction of Jerusalem prior to the second decree. You'll always see the activities of the enemies in this time period. And this is the arrival of the second angel's message and it went through history. And when was the second angel's message empowered? At the midnight cry, the exodus camp meter down here, August 12th through 17th, 1844, the midnight cry empowered the second angel's message. Why am I saying that? Because I want you to see something here, if you will. First angel's message is formalized. 1833 or so, goes through history, and then it's empowered. 
second angel's message arrives in June of 1842, goes through history, and then it's empowered at the midnight cry. Third angel's message arrives October 22nd, 1844, goes through history, and then it's empowered when the angel of Revelation 18 joins it. Same characteristics with all these messages. They go through history for a period of time, then they're empowered. That needs to be noted as you bring these lines together. One of the characteristics of the first way mark is it'll be worldwide. Okay, Sister White says in 1840 the first angel's message went to every mission station in the world. In the first decree, Cyrus in Ezra 1 verses 1 and 2, he says, I'm the king of all the kings of the earth and I make this decree for all the kingdoms of the earth. Um, John the Baptist the messenger of the first way mark in that history, it, the Bible says that all Judea, Jordan, and Jerusalem, and all the regions round about came out to hear John the Baptist. It was worldwide in the geographical setting of that time period. And of course, when this is repeated, when this way mark is repeated in the history of the 144,000, when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, what does Revelation 18 verse 1 say? And the earth was lightened with its glory. So worldwide is one of the characteristics here. One of the characteristics of this way mark, you see the activities of the enemies. One of the characteristics of the third way mark is judgment. October 22nd, 1844, the third angel's message arrives and judgment begins. In the history of Christ, the, this message is the cross where Satan is judged. In the history of the third decree, that decree is what allowed ancient Israel to punish their criminals. This is when their national sovereignty was returned to them. Uh, you can read it in um, Ezra chapter 7 verses 24 through 26. That the, this decree allows them to punish both civil and religious criminals up to and including death. Their national sovereignty was returned when they were allowed to pass judgment. This way Mark will possess a component of judgment and that's worth noting too as you go forward. This way marks followed by disappointment. The Millerites were disappointed on October 23rd, 1844 and Sister White uses the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross to illustrate that but she also uses the disappointment of the Hebrews with the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them which took place immediately after Passover which was the third way mark in the history in the reform movement of Moses because in the reform movement of Moses Passover is where the firstborn was judged and of course we know that Passover is the day that they celebrated throughout all their generations forever that was marked by the cross which was the judgment of Christ's time and that parallels October 22nd 1844 and you'll see a disappointment that follows that every time and these these I'm not catching them all but these characteristics are in your notes after the disappointment God's people are given a work to do uh, Adventists were to understand what the Sabbath was and proclaim the third angel's message immediately after October 22nd that was the work that was given them to do the disciples were given the work of carrying the message of the resurrection to the world after the third decree the Jews were given the work of finishing the work of rebuilding the streets and walls of Jerusalem even in troublous times um, the work that was given to the Jews when they came through the Red Sea and the time period they were going to receive the law was is exemplified in the story of the manna they were together the manna but in all these stories after they're given a work they go into a backslidden condition the Jews flunked the test on the manna they began to collect it at their own discretion the disciples before Pentecost they went fishing the Adventist church brothers and sisters uh, and the Jews in the time period of Nehemiah had quit building the streets and the walls that's why Nehemiah had to be raised up to finish the work and of course before Nehemiah finished the work he secured a fourth decree to do so and Nehemiah's fourth decree is paralleling Pentecost of the time period of Christ and, and paralleling the fourth angel's message of Revelation 18 and of course Pentecost in the time of Christ is paralleling Pentecost the fourth way mark in the history of Moses so what I'm saying is is that and this was a quick overview and I knew it was going to be this way I'll say this <laughs> 
the, the detailed presentation of this, prob probably one of the best that we have, is a series that you can contact us through email or this is my wife back here. Kathy, raise your hand. Kathy, you can contact her. We have a series called Eatonville where we go through this presentation in a very fairly thorough fashion. And I think that you can get the Eatonville series from Brother Edgar off his site by just downloading it. Um, and my closing point on this subject is this. And this is the probably the more serious subject. What I'm saying is, if you go back to page six of your notes, I believe. Nope, got to go back one before that. To page four, the bottom of page four, where it's quoting from Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 13. The fourth paragraph there, where it says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. We already went through that, and we said that this refreshing, next quote, Great Controversy 611, says the refreshing is the latter rain. This refreshing is a message because they refuse to hear it. This is the latter rain message. And this is the message that will test this generation in this history, and that's that's what um, verse 13 says, it says, But the word of the Lord unto this generation, and what was the word of the Lord to the generation of the latter rain? The word of the Lord to them was precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. And what I'm saying to you here, brothers and sisters, if you will follow me, is that the latter rain message is taught to God's people, and it has to be taught to God's people because that's what it's all about. The wise are going to be teachers. And before I can teach it, I have to learn it. It's going to be taught. And the technique that is used to teach the latter rain message is by bringing line upon line from this part of the Bible and from that part of the Bible. And what I'm suggesting to you here is you've just seen the latter rain message laid out in a very quick, not detailed fashion. The line of Moses laid upon the line of Noah, laid upon the line of Elijah, laid upon the line of Cyrus, laid upon the line of John the Baptist, and laid upon the line of William Miller is bringing the banner of the third angel's message together, line upon line, and we read a quote like that here, in order to do what? to illustrate the sequence of events that takes place in the history that all of these histories point forward to the latter rain history. Because God's people are going to have to understand this history before it takes place. They, yeah, why? why? Why do we have to understand this history before it takes place? How, why do we have to understand the latter rain history before it takes place? Because we've got to teach it. I can't teach it if I don't understand it in advance. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, in the writings of Zechariah, chapter 10, verse 1, you tell us that we are to pray for the latter rain and the time of the latter rain. And at this point, I'd ask that you would pour your latter rain out upon us. And we understand that, at least part of the understanding of the latter rain, is that it is a message. We ask that you would open that message to our understanding and that your angels would help us, that your Holy Spirit would help us to be able to not simply understand this message but understand it well enough to teach it to others. We thank you for um, bringing us to this mountaintop and giving us opportunity to discuss and work through these, these truths. And as we break from this meeting, we ask your continued blessing throughout the rest of this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. The note uh, from uh, Ellen White on the four winds that are represented by the Islam. Do you have a quote for that? Yes. 
the, uh, the question for the record, I mean, you recorded yes. this. There's a, there is a quotation um, where Sister White compares the four, says the four winds are represented by an angry horse. I intend to deal with that quotation this weekend um, because those of you that have heard that quotation, um, uh, that you, you, you haven't heard what we have recognized here in the recent past. So I was going to set it up a little bit more um, detailed for us, but we'll do it now. Um, when we first first came across this quotation, we found it in um, Selected Messages, Book 3. Oh, you have, yeah, but I'm not looking for that one. I'm looking for the one in Selected Messages. Um, so you can turn to page 45, but... Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it. Good, good. Uh, when we first found this quote, quite some time ago, we'd already come to our understanding of, of, of Islam. And this quote says, Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse, seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. So we went, wow, you know, that's ex we've already been teaching that the four winds are restrained when Islam arrives in prophetic history. But now Sister White's saying the four winds are the angry horse. And the pioneers have already identified that Islam is represented by a horse in Bible prophecy. That a horse that produces warfare. So we were um, pretty excited about that quote. And that's the quote you're asking about. And you can find it in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 3409. But I'm looking for something else. Give me just one moment here. Um, if you turn now very quickly, and this is a problem. My, my wife tries to correct me on this problem often. You, uh, she knows that in question and answer time, people will ans ask a question that all it takes is one or two words to answer. And I'll take... 10 minutes to answer it. I apologize, but turn to Ezekiel 37 verse 9, okay? If you're not familiar with Ezekiel 37, there's a valley of dead dry bones, and those dead dry bones, Sister White plainly tells us, is the Seventh-day Adventist church, and what brings these dead dry bones to life is the prophecy of Ezekiel, and we have used this for years to demonstrate that Sister White says that our greatest need is for a revival, and she defines revival as a renewal of spiritual life, therefore we're dead, we need to be brought to life, and Sister White teaches in Testimonies to Ministers, page 113, when we understand the prophetic message of Daniel and Revelation as we should there'll be a great revival so we use Ezekiel 37 as a second testimony to that because Ezekiel's shown a valley of dead dry bones that sister white tells us is the seventh day Adventist church and what brings them to life is the prophecy that Ezekiel proclaims right but when when the, the follow this one this is good <laughs> when when the Lord finally brings the Adventist church to life it's in verse 9 okay so let read very carefully with me verse 9. We read it at the beginning. The, uh, he, we were set up for this. But verse 9 says, Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds. O breathe, and breathe upon the slain, that they may live. Now what I'm saying here, and this, I set this up before we started last meeting, is it's not simply prophecy that brings Adventism to life. It's a prophecy that's connected with the four winds. And so when you look at Selected Messages, book 3, page 409, you see Sister White saying that the four winds are represented as an angry horse. But do you know where the passage comes from that they put in Selected Messages, book 3, page 409? It comes from Manuscript Releases, Volume 20, page 217. And it says a little bit more. It says, Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse, seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. But you know what she says then? 
Shall we sleep on the very verge? Shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull and cold and dead? Oh, that we might have in our churches the spirit and the breath of God breathed into his people that they might stand upon their feet and live. Sister White is using the very words of Ezekiel 37. The very words. We need to see that the way is narrow and the gate straight, but as we pass through the straight gate, its wideness is without, without limit. Sister White saying, this is angry horses, the four winds. But the message of the four winds in Ezekiel 37, 9, what it does, read verse 10. It says, so I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, a great army. And Sister White says, oh, that we might have in our churches the spirit and the breath of God breathed into his people, that they might stand upon their feet and live. She's saying the four winds that are restrained in Revelation 7 are the identical four winds of Ezekiel 37, 9. And she's saying what we need to understand about these four winds is they're represented by the angry horse of Islam. But anyway, <laughs> you ask. <laughs> Any other question? <laughs> yes. All right. Oh, hold on. The angry horse of Islam. Oh. Uh, this is your personal application. Yeah. She says the hangry horse. The angry horse, yeah. But yeah. Uh, we need to make a differentiation because she doesn't say the angry horse of Islam. Yeah. It's very w important. Some, that of, we us, be some of us may need to make that distinction. Some of us will be held accountable if we're incorrect for putting the wrong emphasis it's on that. It's very important when we say that something that Sister White said. It's very important we don't place in her mouth what she didn't say. Yeah, I, I've, on that very quote, yeah. I've been challenged. And here's where I go. The 1843 was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there is a prophecy of this chart in God's word. And if this chart is needed by one, then it's needed by all. That's a paraphrase. And on both these charts... Islam is represented by this war horse. The restraining of Islam is part of the prophecy of the sixth trumpet. It's part of the prophecy of the sixth trumpet here. The restraint that is placed on Islam is part of their prophetic, prophetic heritage. So when Sister White is saying that there is a restraint placed upon the four winds and the four winds are an angry horse, yes, I am putting a personal application upon the angry horse being Islam, but there is... <laughs> I, I, you know, there's no doubt about it. Let's be, let's be honest. I've got criticism about how I presented prophecy for 15 years publicly, and one of the common criticisms that I get is that I go just a little bit too far in the emphasis that I put on things. So I will give it to you that based upon the last 15 years, uh, on a regular basis, that's been a criticism that's been leveled my way. So brothers and sisters, beware. That is a weakness. We are to confess our faults one to another. That's one of my faults. And one of my faults is, is that based upon the prophetic testimony of Islam and, who, and what they are, which we're going to deal with in more detail this weekend, I do say that the angry horse is Islam. <laughs> but Sister White doesn't. But I'm saying the that the prophetic testimony of the Bible and spirit of prophecy says it clearly. That's the point I wanted to make, Brother Jeff. Yep. Yep. Uh, I don't it's mind. very important to differentiate between your interpretation of what Ellen White is saying and what she is saying. Uh, it might be true, but she didn't say that the angry horse is Islam. Yes. Yeah, yeah. in other places. There's, a, there's more, there's other things. But anyway, any other questions? A comment. But, uh, he, he wants to record it, I think. When you were talking about uh, being weaned from the breast and the milk, I just wanted to comment that uh, in um, Matthew 24, verse 19, uh, Jesus proclaims a woe upon um, 
those that are fleeing either in the winter or on the Sabbath and woe unto those that uh, are giving, you know. Uh, Suck in those days. Yeah. So, of course, we know that a woman is a church. And so if the church is giving watered down milk as a message, he's proclaiming a woe upon those people. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Any other comments? That our pastor, are you going to let him get away with that? You didn't let me get away with it. That was the, he read into that a whole lot more than I read into the angry horse. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I'm going to let him get away with it myself. There are implications of what he is saying, and we need to hear. We need to hear what are the implications that he is wanting to communicate. Because there are implications. Yeah, they're defendable, though. One, uh, some of the implications I see are defendable. In each of these reform movements, yes. the message that comes to the people is opposed by a class in this history, and the message they give can be illustrated as milk. So, okay. th 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 it so he, he, his comment is regarding that? Because I came That's how I understand okay. it, but uh, was that a I fair. I, I wonder if he is saying that. You don't understand my comment? No, I don't, know, I don't understand. I'm basically drawing a parallel with uh, the bill being uh, a watered-down message or something yeah. for beginners. And, and Christ is proclaiming a woe. And I, I'm, I'm applying that to a watered-down message to a, to a church, which is a woman giving suck. In other words, giving milk for a watered-down message. Uh, Brother yeah. Jeff? Just a, a quick comment on, on, on his comment. I think there's a difference between a watered-down message and milk, spiritual milk. Uh, a watered-down message, uh, in, in my view, it's something that has been compromised. Uh, milk is the beginning food for spiritual babies. So I, I would not equate necessarily the two of them. Okay, well, there's so we've opened up a, a, a whole new topic, and I'm getting drawn in. And I'm going I'm to enter in on this one. Uh, 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 I'm the moderator. But I, 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 I agree with both of you partially, but I, I disagree too from the premise of a, a, a statement that we made, that we read. Sister White says, there's many wonderful truths in the Word of God, but what the flock of God needs now is present truth. And the, the presentation of truth of the milk that the beginners need even if it's truth at a time period of present truth can be a dangerous message if that's all the flock of God is receiving. In a time period when I need to hear present truth if all I'm being fed is milk um, it's, it's detrimental to, to my experience and there is a time period mentioned in scripture where it says at the time when you ought to be teachers you're drinking milk when you shouldn't be. And what I'm saying is in the latter rain time period, we are s that's a time period when we're supposed to be teachers. And there is no, t this is not the time period that God's people should be distributing milk. Present truth. And, and you read it. This, and is, this is your argument. And the chart is present truth according to the prophecy of Habakkuk. Yeah. And wha where's the horse? Where is the horse? Well, yeah, where is the horse? On where is it? On this present truth yeah, chart. Yeah, on both of them. Yeah. So. Anyway. There are horses also uh, in other places in, in Revelation. It does not always point to the to this context that you mentioned. Right? And those, the horses that are in the first four seals are also illustrated twice in the book of Zechariah. And when you bring all those together, it's very easy to demonstrate that those horses are representing works that are accomplished under the Lord's providence. It's not, those are not representing um, powers of Bible prophecy. They are representing 
providential histories that are being governed by the Lord. They're, they're, they're sim they're symbol the symbols, they're not, they're not the same symbol as the symbol of the horses in Revelation 9. Just, there's many things that we need to learn, but there are many, many that we have to unlearn. Yeah, a few months, she says. And how is that fulfilled? Line upon line. Not, well, I, I, yeah, by teaching. But, you know, I'll, I'll share with you how uh, uh, recently I've came to understand that's fulfilled. In these reform movements, there always comes a time when the message is formalized. But the message continues to develop as it's testing this generation. And I submit to you that in, in this history here, we're down here. Without, get, without getting into the techniques, we're already down here. The message has already been formalized and it's already getting built on. And the message has been formalized now. If I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I come into this meeting today and I, I hear these things for the very first, for the very first th time, things that have been in the Advent public arena for, say, 15 years. Okay, they've been out there for a long time. And I come and I say, wow, I, I, this seems like something I need to understand and I need to understand it quickly. It just so happens that all those presentations are available on audio CD and DVDs and magazines and articles. And if someone wants to just go home and wrap their mind around those things, they can learn this message in just a couple months, what it's been taking some of us years to learn. And on the website. And on the websites. Yeah. Any, uh, I'm just saying there's, there are a multitude of materials available that weren't available at the time of the end. All right, so let's just take a couple, maybe one more question before we break so that we can stretch our legs before the next meeting. One more, or are we fine? Okay, so let's take a break, stretch, 